why are we seeing a huge race? What's the city view? Is it a good idea? What, what's going on with this wave of M&A activity sweeping the TMT yeah. sectors? Well, you told me to introduce myself first. Do you do that? I'm Will Milner. I work for Arise <laughs> Research. Um, it's a global equity research company focused on tech, media, um, and telco. Um, I've looked at the US uh, media and cable companies for a while now. Um, what is driving all of these deals? I mean, the first point, I guess, is they're all being driven out of the US, so you probably need to start at the US. Um, I'd say the second point, no big surprise, but fragmentation of viewing, particularly amongst younger audiences, is particularly acute in the US. We're seeing studies that, you know, viewing of traditional TV amongst under 25s is probably down 40% since 2010. There's lots of data and surveys around that, um, and people can dispute um, the data. I think Nielsen might, might dispute that, but there's big, you know, that's a big issue in terms of how you fill the funnel um, of new TV users um, in the US. Um, and I think the whole business model in the US, the big bundle, the linear bundle of 200 networks, has become far too expensive over the years. The business model of wholesalers bundling together networks, selling those networks to distributors, um, getting annual escalator fees for their, for their content despite ratings down, you know, high single digits every year is, is a business model that needs change ultimately. Um, it's been amazingly successful. Four out of five US homes take pay TV, they pay over 100 bucks a month for it. But, you know, with all the other alternatives out there, that model needs to change and you're now seeing cord cutting running at between three and four percent a year. So, Structurally, there's some big issues in US pay so, so, so fundamentally, your view is that the wave of mega deals driven from the US predominantly is being driven by the weakness of the US market? I th the, the weird thing is, and it's back to sort of Ante's point, I think he made it the, in the first presentation, you can't yet really see it in a lot of the financials, which is the interesting thing. So affiliate fees continue to be very healthy in terms of revenue growth. And um, for the content owners, advertising is held up very well. But there's just this sense that we are nearing a tipping point um, and a fear that there might be faster acceleration of customer losses ahead. Um, so these companies ultimately, are, I think, you know, they're trying to preserve the traditional TV business model. That's a hugely cash generative cash cow. And they're trying to buy new companies, acquire new skill sets for the new world that, that media is going to become over the next 10, 20 years. And, and very briefly, do you think investors are generally positive about the impact of these deals? Do they see them as a, a sensible response to the current predicament of these businesses? I think they're all, every deal is, is obviously a bit different and clearly, you know, the price paid is, is hugely important. I think, they, I think the investment community understands the issues with the traditional TV model in the US. I think they understand the issues around affordability. Um, I think they're balking at the prices that are being paid and I think the prices that are being paid signify a problem around the corner that we can't yet see. Right. I think that's the, the fundamental issue. Okay, we will come back to that. Ian, do you <laughs> want to tell us a bit about what you do at Liberum? Sure. So I've, Liberum is an is independent investment bank. So sort of we do investment banking and research. I'm a, a research analyst. I've covered the media sector for nearly 20 years uh, and cover the pan-European media sector. And also as well, look at the online and digital space uh, uh, as well. I think sort of, of much uh, uh, sort of what Will has said, I mean, sort of, of would be in agreement with. I think there's a, a couple of sort of points that, that would add. I think it's absolutely right. The, the M&A activity has really been driven by the states. To a degree, a lot of that is just because of the, the nature of the European market. Your yeah. content tends to be very local. So you've obviously got different nationalities. It doesn't really make that much sense for pan-European free-to-air broadcasters, for example. So there's not really that much in the way of synergies. There are some in terms of pay TV or so on, as you've seen with Sky. But again, not necessarily a huge amount when it comes to, when it comes to the business model and so forth. I think what you do have it in, in the media space, I'd perhaps be a little bit more optimistic in work than well maybe on the, the traditional media side and what's, what's necessarily happening there. I think in terms of the M&A side, it definitely is being driven by fear and uncertainty as where the business models are actually going in the future. If you look, for example, at the bid for Sky, sort of, of Comcast and Disney had slightly different sort of approaches as to why they wanted that asset. Mm. So if you were Comcast, you wanted to increase the revenues that came outside of a US cable business, the percentage of revenues from outside. So you were diversifying your revenues. If you look at Disney, it's a very interesting model that they're now actually formulating, which is to go direct to consumer. So they say, we've got this range of content. Traditionally, we've sold this through the, the traditional pay TV operators. Now we've actually got to, to be, as it were, a Netflix-style model 
where we actually have that interaction with, with customers. Now, I think one question, which will be interesting sort of to see over the next five to 10 years is, you know, is it that essentially audiences, younger audiences, are necessarily moving away from TV-style content, or is it that they're just watching it in different formats? So, for example, if you take the bar research that was published yesterday, that were in terms of Project Dovetail, you look at the sort of audience uplift that you get when you account for devices, tablets, mobile, PCs, etc. Take sports, dramas, probably around 4 or 5% uplift at most. If you take something like The Violent, you get a 25% uplift in terms of the audience once you take into account devices. And this, I think, is one of the problems that has been, particularly for the TV industry, is, is it a question that younger audiences are not watching their content? I think that's actually not so much of an issue as the measurement issue. Yeah. Right. They've not actually been able to measure the watching on these devices, and therefore, because you're not able to measure it, you can't monetize it properly. So the, the sort of evidence that seems to be coming so far is that yeah, it's not as though younger audience, millennials, whatever you want to call them, have suddenly decided we're going to watch videos of dancing cats 24 hours a day. They still want that content. The question is how they're watching that content. And one question I would have in terms of the, the disruptors, the fangs, the Netflixes, and so forth is, I think you know, all looks OK at the moment, although there's some question marks about their business models. In fact, the, the sort of three to five year view, I think the real question is for the fangs. You know, can Facebook's valuation be justified by the amount of advertising revenues it can gain? There's a question for saying it can't. Netflix, can it continue to have that level of subscriber growth? Answer, probably not. OK, you fantastically, both of you, set out the issues we want to really get stuck into. Let's start with Comcast Sky yep. as the sort of obvious mega deal that's just taken place, or is still taking place, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, straightforward question to both of you. Has Comcast massively overpaid? It's a huge premium over the share price, yeah. as was. I mean, Will, what, what's your view? What's going on here? I think on any normal financial measure, they've overpaid. And, and describe How, what you mean by normal financial measure. They, they paid 30 billion sterling for a business that generates 600 to 800 million of, of cash a year. That's, that's 40 times cash flow. Um, that's sort of multiple you would probably put on a high growth startup. Sky is, you know, and respect to all the Sky employees in the room, it's a fantastic company, highly innovative, but it's a mature satellite distribution business in large part across its markets. Um, so I think Comcast, for Comcast, it's purely about diversification at this stage. They're not going to change the business model. They wanted, as you mm -hmm. made the point, direct customer relationships. They are intrigued by the Now TV platform. They are impressed with um, AdSmart. Um, but the multiple paid ignores some of the risks inherent in Sky's business model. A lot of its content is rented, it's not owned. Um, the cost of Premier League rights depends on another BT or somebody emerging to drive those costs up in the future. HBO is a big supplier of content. What happens with, with HBO content going forward and AT&T's intentions there? So, and obviously we know that Disney mm -hmm. Fox is going to put its arms around its content going forward and that content's going to become more restricted. So, you know, there's some risks around Sky's business model and the sources of Sky's content, which Comcast will look at and say, that's fine, we will invest more in original productions, we'll, we're going to backstop that and use our heft, um, financial heft to support it, which I think is great. But I think ultimately, have they overpaid, we'll, we'll find out um, in a few years. But it's a big old price that they've paid. Ian, I mean, I, I, I read your notes every morning with great interest. <laughs> and I know Poor that you, you. you've been fairly bearish about <laughs> yeah. Sky for a while. Mm. Presumably, you agree with Will's analysis, which just raises the obvious question. Why have they paid such a huge price? No, I think that's true. I mean, again, if you look at any financial metric, it's hard to justify the price. Certainly so what, on the, what explains it? Strategic. If you look at it, again, it comes back to this point. If you are Comcast, you are worried about the trends that you're seeing within the US market that you, are, you want diversified revenue streams. Apparently, I heard this yesterday, apparently the story that the Comcast CEO that everyone mocks, he was in a taxi, <laughs> uh, and sort of thought, Sky's such a great product, apparently is true. <laughs> uh, so uh, there you go, you make a big deal based on that. But, but I think if you, if you are Comcast, you are looking at things, it's not just necessarily the Sky business itself, it is this whole thing of what you can bring back to the US. And, I guess the UK, in, if you were to look at the open markets as the closest to the US, I guess, in terms of the structure and nature of household, you'd say the UK is closest. And you'd argue Sky's done a reasonably good job 
at sort of, of blunting the impact of what's happened with Netflix. I mean, it's still seeing mid-single-digit revenue growth. It's still seeing double-digit operating profit growth. In an environment where the pay TV market in its three core markets, Germany, Italy and the UK, is stagnating yeah, on there, and it's becoming harder to get more money from customers. I mean, it's a lot of money to spend for something that you hope will transform your US business. Mm. And presumably, I mean, Comcast has onboarded Netflix as well onto mm. their TV platform. Mm. So do you really think they're expecting that somehow owning Sky and the Sky management team will transform the Comcast business back at base and help them deal with some of the weaknesses in their domestic market? I think initially, no. Right. You know, I think the Comcast cable business in the US is seven times bigger than Sky. It's hugely cash generative. Sky is, as far as we can see, a chip. Um, and I think, you know, the context of this is obviously Comcast, you know, and the Roberts mm. family have rolled up cable companies for 50 years in the US. You know, in 2015, they lost out on Time Warner Cable. They lost out to Disney on the Fox assets. The moment they backed down from that, mm. you just got the feeling that there was no way they were going to walk away from the Fox carve up with nothing. Mm. Um, so there's some sort of, you know, there's some context in terms of where and, the deals come from. And I guess to Ian's point, is mm. this partly about the scarcity value of assets like Sky? Is that if you're Comcast and you, you're, very, you're very cash generative, mm. you're a huge business, you're looking for homes for that cash and ways to transform your business and find and unlock new growth, yeah. There's not much else you can do with that money. Sky's mm. kind of one of the last assets left. Totally, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think if, you, if, you're looking for a multi, if you're looking for international diversification and a platform from which you can build that has an established customer base, 23 million customers, the list is very, very short. And I um, think that's... Oh, sorry, I yeah. think that's important as well, is that... Yeah, I think it would be in terms of Comcast. There's the, the business that you have at the moment and the business that you can have in the future. Yeah, and mm. that 23 million customer base... Yeah, it's huge. Yeah, and yeah, you look at a traditional pay TV business, you would say it faces challenges. But if you're Comcast and thinking on a five, 10 year view and thinking, okay, more and more of the content providers are going direct to, mm. to the consumer, has a risk, possibly also as well has an opportunity in terms of saving costs on the side of things. But having that direct relationship in the, in the future, are there any more ways I can monetize this content? Yeah, it's interesting if you, if you take sort of free to air broadcasters, yeah, increasingly, if you listen to them, the argument is we had our content, we monetized it through TV advertising revenues, we may have done a bit in terms of content sales. You look at our argument now, it is we have TV advertising, we have video advertising, online video advertising, which is entirely a new market, retransmission revenues, content, addressable TV, direct to consumer, selling products, etc. So, yeah, I think for Comcast, that's probably how they're looking at things in the future. There are more and more things to sell to these customers. The key thing is you need that customer base in the, in the first place, and Sky really gives you that. It's one of the few assets that does. Mm. Right, let's jump on and look a bit at, if we can just get, there we go. Um, right, um, let's have a little look at what's really happening in terms of the deals in the States. Mm. So, first mm. of all, one thing I just want to very quickly tick off. Y mm. You will sometimes hear people in the industry talk about the fact that a lot of these deals are basically being driven by cheap credit. Yep. But the strategic rationale is not something that really stacks up, mm -hmm. or at least it's a kind of post hoc mm. rationalisation. Mm -hmm. This is all about low interest rates, people looking for a home, too much money sloshing around the system. It, I mean, Will, is there any truth in that, or is it a complete red herring? <laughs> I mean, I, I, think, I think tax reform in the US has been a massive driver mm. of these deals. I mean, Comcast was already a fabulously cash generative cable company. I think to then slash corporate tax rates to give a full deduction for the investment they make in their cable network every year, made that tax deductible, has probably boosted their cash flow two or $3 billion every year. So if you're sitting there as Comcast and you're generating $12, $13 billion of cash a year, and you're thinking about making an acquisition, mm -hmm. you're seeing interest rates going up, which is now what's happening. Money is still very, very cheap, and these deals are generally debt financed. Um, obviously, Disney Fox is a bit different, but now is the time to do them. You've been given a windfall. You've got interest rates going up. There's a lot going on in the industry mm. that we're talking about in terms of how you make a shift from traditional to direct to consumer, but you've kind of got to go now. Mm. Ian, you on the same page? Yeah, I, I, I would say the cheap credit is an enabler rather than necessarily is the, the primary driver. You know, what it's probably allowed these companies to do is actually do deals. Mm that maybe they wouldn't have done in the past because the economics wouldn't have worked. Right. Yeah, you know, these companies could have used the cash for other things. They could have used it to buy back shares, which you know, increasingly popular, could have dividends. Yeah, in some cases, sort of increased the wages for employees uh, and so on. 
So I don't think it is, they've not just thought, right, we've got this cash, let's go and spend it on something. Some companies do, because some managements are incentivized by EPS growth, which right. in an age of cheap credit, sorry, that's earnings per share growth, sort of in an age of cheap credit, if you can borrow low, buy some assets, you naturally boost that number. So it's not unhelpful. All right, let's now turn and look at the different types of deals. So th the obvious big sort of mm. deal which has taken place is AT&T Time Warner. It's mm -hmm. got its Department of Justice, Justice clearance, yep. so the deal is now going ahead. But th there seems to be a lot of confusion about what this deal is actually about. So you can certainly read analyst reports saying, well, it seems very hard to take a sort of horizontally distributed business which sells its content to everyone mm -hmm. and somehow withhold their content to benefit your own TV business. You know, in other words, you're just going to destroy more value than you create, probably. We heard views earlier today that this deal is really about advanced advertising. It's about mm -hmm. unlocking the potential of addressable TV around those assets. I mean, Ian, why don't you start on this one? at and Time Warner, what, what's really happening there? What's the logic? I think the, the, there's a mixture of things. I mean, first of all, it's convergence. Yeah, in the sense that if you are a telco company and you're thinking about where things could go, you know, what you're thinking is, is the risk to my customer base from essentially people deciding that they go with a cable operator rather than a telco operator. You know, traditionally, cable operators, although in the US their, their reputation is bad, have had a bit of better service quality than, than telco operators when it comes to things. If you look in the UK, BT got into content because Sky was cannibalizing it, its customer base when it was able to offer triple play. That is definitely an aspect to sort of win in there. Again, it's a little bit of a fear factor, sort of when things go. The market penetration is high. So again, essentially, you want to make more money. Effectively, you've got to consolidate the market. Um, I'm skeptical about addressable TV. You know, the, the point being there is it gets talked up a lot. But certainly, if you, if you look at the sort of, it's very interesting when you go back when Sky, we're talking about addressable TV a number of years back. What they were very clear about, and they've always been clear about, is saying addressable TV doesn't really cannibalise TV advertising revenues. This is new advertisers. Mm. Well, what it essentially cannibalises is direct mail. Yeah, it's essentially, it's another way of actually targeting the customer directly, just as you would with a mail shop. That's fine. It pulls an SMEs that you wouldn't have got before with TV advertising. But direct mail is not, not a huge market. It's not a game changer. So it's nice to have, but not necessary. More interesting point, I think, for, for that, and again, it's future, and it goes back to the question of the Facebooks and so forth. You look at Facebook in terms of their ad revenues, you know, what is really the strength of them is a long tail of SME customers. You know, what you're increasingly seeing now in addressable TV is one thing, what the broadcasters are talking about with their video on demand products is another, what the likes of JC Deco are talking about with some of their digital screens is saying what digital allows you, particularly with programmatic, a lot more effective targeting at particular times of the day. And what they're saying is that then allows them to actually target SMEs by saying, look, you know, for 10 or 15 minutes, you can buy this screen. But just to be clear, what you're saying is that we can't explain a sort of AT&T Warner mega deal by saying it's about adjustable advertising. It's about buying up some, again, scarce assets as a hedge against future risk. And I, I, I would agree. I mean, I, I think it's at and I mean, those owning content and distribution under one company has always been a tough, you know, act to sort of explain. I mean, Comcast obviously bought NBC. They bought it from GE, a knockdown price, one of the best deals in media for years and years and years. AT&T bought DirecTV and now obviously Time Warner. It's got $180 billion mm. of debt, which it can service because debt's cheap. It's yeah. doing it because the cash generative, you know, and those businesses can then support AT&T's dividend, which has gone up every year for 30 years. So, you know, the motivations, I think, are very different. I think mm. AT&T, you know, faces a problem because it's basically using video to support the wireless business. It's bundling DTV with wireless. It's discounting DTV very, very aggressively to the point that... You know, video gross profit, having bought DTV, has gone from 19 billion to 14 in two years. And that's catastrophic, right. that, that mm. level of discounting. Yeah. So to kind of explain this deal away as, hey, it's advanced advertising, yeah. you look at the numbers and you think, guys, <laughs> yeah. this is not washing. Right. You know, you've basically shored up the dividend with these massive acquisitions. You're now trying to backfill it with an explanation around advanced advertising, which I think people are rightly sceptical of, mm. given the track record AT&T has. Yeah. And, and, and the other explanation, which is very commonly referred to in the press, is that companies are buying up assets which can fuel their desire to create international Netflix-style direct-to-consumer subscription businesses. 
So Disney Fox is yeah. very probably going to mm. roll out to kind of Netflix wannabe. Yeah. AT&T is going to do the same. How, do you buy that as a rationale for these deals, Ian? Um, yeah, I, I think that's what the company managements are thinking. Yeah, again, there is this whole thing that is fear factor. They're thinking if the traditional pay TV model goes, where do I actually get the route to my customer? Therefore, you had to go more direct to consumer. Yeah, again, it, it's, it's a question mark, though, of how many subscription services the customer will take and how much they're prepared to pay. And I think the other thing that also gets missed in this debate, and it, it's probably a feature of the fact that we are, we're not probably representative of the general population, you know, by any stretch of the sure. imagination, is that, you know, what you see is services such as pay TV tend to be a lot stickier. Because when it comes to TV, people actually, they're quite passive in their forms. I think there was a stat that one saw that if you take, for example, time shifted TV, you know, more than half Americans actually sit through the ads, even though they could fast forward. And I'm sure for the UK it's the same. You, know, you come home, you sit in front, it's quite easy to do. You pay some subscription every month. very entrenched behaviours. Exactly. You know, we're still and, watching 26 hours of TV. And that's very, very difficult to change. And sure, it can change and it can change over time. But you've really got to have a gangbuster product. I mean, I think, the other, yeah, I think the other thing is to build that direct consumer business, you've, you're faced with a decision as to whether you cut off the licensing of content, mm. you know, which, which currently has been, you know, great. Or you have to get great with your window. Company. So, yeah, exactly. So, so Comcast makes about two, NBC makes about 200 million bucks a year licensing content. Mm. Now, if it were to follow Disney and say, right, we're going to, Disney's taking a very aggressive approach to saying, right, we're going to stop licensing to Netflix. We're going all in. We've bought the Fox Studios. We've bought the cable networks. We're going to fill out our Disney Direct to Consumer app, Hulu and ESPN Plus. And we're going to wear the hit. We're, going to, we're wearing the hit on abandoning those content licensing revenues, which are nearly 100% margin, um, and build this business for the future. Comcast is not going to do that. You speak and, to and Comcast. Disney Fox and... feels very unique in a sense because they have such an enormous range of channels and film labels mm. and production businesses. You know, they have enough assets to keep selling to the US pay TV industry and globally, as well as rolling out their own OTT offerings. Yeah, I think, I think the really interesting thing with Disney is whether they can defend the traditional model while they're in traditional US TV model while they're investing more and more outside it in direct consumer. Because the traditional model is built on an agreement between Disney and Comcast that Comcast pays them more every year for their content. Um, but if you can get that content outside of the traditional TV bundle, why would you sign up to pay more for it every year, which has been the basis of the US TV model for the last two or three decades? All right. Let's jump along and talk about the next bit of the equation. Um, <coughs> if we can just go back. Bang. <laughs> so... What lots of people in the incumbent or traditional media industry would love to believe is that we're right in the middle of a massive bubble. That the FANG companies, obviously very different, mm -hmm. in slightly different ways, are ridiculously overvalued by the investment community and rewarded with sky-high share prices. Yep. You know, we have, we have trillion-dollar companies, at least one of those four. Yep. Mm. Is there any truth in this? Are these companies being hugely overvalued? I, I think it is... Different. I don't think you could put them all as one. Sure. Yeah, yeah. the best. So if you... Which to, one is most overvalued? I would say it's a choice between Facebook and Netflix. Right. And why and is that? Probably. Well, Facebook, again, yeah, in terms of the valuation, in terms of what you have to assume in terms of their share of advertising moving forwards, the numbers just don't stack up. I mean, you already look at the metrics. You, you look in terms of the sort of what's happening in terms of particularly younger demographics moving out of the product. The key problem also for them, you, you can now start to see, as has happened if you look on a historical pattern, they're now in that sort of vicious circle where effectively they're being targeted, people are complaining about their, ad their adverts, they come out with more measures, it reduces the efficiency of the product and so on. So bigger advertisers, I mean, there was, I don't know whether this is true or not, but, but one comment I had heard was that Facebook, for example, in the UK, you, you know, in June, sort of actually hadn't seen any growth. You know, whether that's true or not, I don't know. You know, but, but it would suggest, I think, that bigger advertisers sort of are perhaps losing faith with the product. SMEs at the moment are still fine. If you take Netflix, again, it comes back to this point. You know, if you are Netflix, your problem here is that you're like a hamster on a wheel. You need to actually get your subscriber growth sort of continually moving forward at high rates. So you have to invest in these big new dramas that attract people into the, into the arena. The problem with that is it only takes one or two times when you don't. And essentially, your business model then starts to fall apart. Your cash flow is very high. 
So, so these, these stocks are clearly being valued as momentum stocks. They have to keep showing growth in subscriber numbers, revenues and so on. Yeah. Wh which ones do you feel are most fairly valued of the FANG quartet? <laughs> I mean, I, I, would, I would say probably at this stage, Google. Right. Um, I, I'd slightly disagree. I mean, I think Facebook certainly has sold off a lot on the back of the, mm -hmm. you know, data um, scandals that we've Biggest seen. Biggest ever one day. Correct, you know, market cap loss, yeah. I mean, it's been enormous, the, the sort of adjustment in Facebook. And actually, the multiple doesn't look horrendous, but I think there's a, you know, to your point, yeah. there's a massive sense that 40% growth, which might become 30% revenue growth, it might become 20. We actually, when you step back, you, don't, you can't support that growth going forward. And what's built in over the next three years in terms of incremental sales for Facebook is quite scary. Right. You know, so I think people look at it and are pausing for thought. I think... You know, Netflix, clearly, you know, to your point, mm. Netflix is going to burn three to four billion in cash this mm. year. It's got 165 billion market cap. So you somehow need to go from minus exactly. three and a half burn to over 10 of cash for it to make any sense. That's and just, just help, because I'm sure lots of people in the audience, and I certainly talk to broadcasters mm. who say, this is just not a level playing field. These companies are not, they're able to spend money in a way that we can only dream of that they're awarded with sky-high valuations despite making almost nothing. Is there any truth in that? Is that a fair complaint? Well, I didn't buy Netflix because I thought that. But, <laughs> yeah. but, but you know, look, you know, at the end of the day, Netflix, there's very few media companies that are going to add $4 billion in incremental sales this year. Netflix right. will. Right. Equally, there's very few that are going to burn $3.5 in cash. You know, so your bet on Netflix becomes this you know, slightly tiring debate as to whether 130 million subs becomes 200 or 300 or 400 and whether their ARPU is truly going to be $10 in India in 10 years' time. And it becomes an opinion debate mm. rather than anything you can, you know, have a substantial debate I think, I think the comment about being unfair that they can spend all this cash, I mean, what, what's, what's got to be remembered in all this is, is that Netflix's model is different from, let's say, an ITV's. Sure. You know, if, you, if you're ITV, you're essentially looking for a big mass market audience in your home country, Coronation Street, Amadeo, whatever you want to call it. If, if you are Netflix... Essentially, what you have to produce in terms of your hit shows is content that essentially appeals to a global niche. So a Netflix user in the UK, US, Italy, Germany, India, Japan, etc. If you were to take them, they would sort of undoubtedly have similar characteristics yeah, in terms of how they use technology, how they use services and so forth. You don't necessarily need to get a mass market audience sort of with those products in each market. All you need to do is essentially sort of build up that niche and sort of the numbers quickly stack up. And, and the challenge for Netflix specifically is obviously that to, 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 to justify that valuation, they have to keep showing momentum in subscriber growth. And that's more and more going to come from international markets because the US is maturing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Does that start to become problematic? Can we expect as subscriber growth slows, as it has with Facebook, mm -hmm. for example, user growth, mm -hmm. to see their valuation plummet? Oh, look, you know, from that valuation, absolutely. I right. think the challenge for Netflix is they're spending more per customer this year than they were last year. Right. Now, if you ask people whether that was the case three or four years ago, they'd have been absolutely shocked. But, you know, Reed Hastings will stand up and tell you that the more cash I burn, the yeah. more successful I am. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you're dealing with. And, and, and you've just got to... Netflix is a story stock. You've got to jump on and believe. It, OK. But, but financial analysis will not get you to that valuation. We are running perilously short of time. Let's just jump on a little bit then, if we can go back. Here we go. So we've done Netflix. Um, right. Oh. Let's do European consolidation. So mm. lots of folks here are sitting as employees of... European companies, and I think what lots of them want to know is, mm -hmm. are we going to see more European consolidation in the media and pay TV industry, the broadcast <laughs> industry, or actually are the prospects quite limited? I mean, Ian, pay TV, lots more or not much? Well, pay TV, you've already seen it. Yep. You know, so it's what, Sky. You know, Sky has been doing it for years, same in the cable industry as well, you know, with Liberty Global. So that, that's already happened. I think if you were to take the free-to-air space, the TV advertising space, the, argument, the, the answer would be no. Yeah, if you listen to what the broadcasters, sort of all the broadcasters will say is the, the actual rationale of doing cross-border deals doesn't really make sense. You know, content is local. So in terms of, and given that's the biggest part of their spend, it's very hard to actually extract synergies from that, or indeed both on the advertising side and on the cost side. What you're more likely to see are deals like you've seen, for example, RTL and ITV, right. or what you've seen, Mediaset, TF1, sort of Channel 4 and so forth, where essentially the broadcasters come together and think, okay, are there areas, common areas that we can sort of cooperate in 
and advance their interests. So if you look at Media Certainty F1, they've got a common advertising house in London, sure. helps out with that. If you look with RTL and, and ITV, yeah, they're talking more about essentially programmatic sales of, of TV advertising. Um, sort of one just quick, quick sort of read across there. It's very, very interesting if you look at what a lot of the, the, the sort of, of, if you want to call them video providers, and I sort of include the outdoor companies now increasingly with that, what they are increasingly talking about is the desire to actually go direct to the advertiser. And the language is, and this is not just one company, this is you know, a consistent theme that is starting to come out, is what they're saying is, yes, the media buyers will still remain very important, but actually what we want to do is actually go direct to the advertiser. It's a better proposition for us. We take more share of the, uh, of the revenues. And also as well, in some cases, they feel as though the media buyers are not necessarily sort of advance their interests. So I think it's more of that aspect you will see. OK, so lots of cooperation, mm. lots of joint ventures, but not much actual acquisitive or merged activity. I, th I think the reality is Europe, certainly when you compare it, the US is just an incredibly fragmented market. You know, so to, to, to gain scale by acquisition is going to take a very long time. And, and the track record, if you look at mm, Vivendi yeah. and TI and Mediaset, yeah. that didn't end well. You know, there's a lot, it, it's a highly politicised environment. Yep. You've got regulators in Europe who are focused first and foremost on reducing prices um, in lots of areas. It, it's a difficult area to do business in. So I think partnerships make a lot more sense and you're seeing more and more of them. And just briefly, before we go to our final question, um, ITV, I mean, mm -hmm. for at least for the last 10 years, people have been talking about somebody pouncing on <laughs> ITV. It hasn't happened yet. Sky's just gone. Do we see mm. ITV going in the next two, three years? Is the city expecting a deal or a bid? I, I think the city is expecting it's possible. I mean, if you were to say what would be the advantage uh, of doing so, you would say the, the share price has come down, so it's cheaper. Obviously, the pound has come down. So for, from a deal perspective, it's an enabler rather than necessarily a <coughs> sort of odd big strategic driver. But ITV gives you dominance in the TV advertising market in the UK, increasingly online VOD, increasingly also as well gives you a large degree of content. I think a lot will come down to whether the big companies, what their view is of sort of TV advertising, whether it's viable or not. And at the moment, we're in that strange pattern where sort of, the, certainly in the city, I think linear TV has been seen as dead for a couple of years. Now starting to be some slight changes in that attitude. And it's, I mean, you're, you're famously bullish about the prospects <laughs> yeah. of the free-to-air broadcasters. You've yeah. got buy, buy, buy ratings all over them, yeah. generally speaking, or at least on ITV. Yeah. Do you think the view has changed, has shifted? It's starting to shift. I think what's starting to be realised is this is not just about linear TV. Effectively, the broadcasters are TV content providers, and that may seem like a technical phrase. But the key there is that their content can increasingly be shown across all platforms, you know, online, TV, and whatever. And the advantage there is that essentially you dip into the TV advertising pot, increasingly they're starting to dip into the online advertising pot. So there's growth in Van Dyer Hills. Exactly. Will, briefly, ITV, a, a target, I scarcity mean, value? I, I think any company at Liberty Global has a stake in is, is going to be seen as a target. Right. Um, I think, I mean, I like the way ITV are positioning themselves at the moment. Yeah. I think they're much more on the front foot. I think they're, you know, aggressively going after mm. some of the, the sort of myths around digital advertising. I like that. I think that's what broadcasters should be doing. Um, OK, and now our final question, which I'm sure will be of interest to lots of our panel. Um, there's lots of ad tech people here. Some of them may get bonuses at the end of the year. They might have £100, let's yeah. say, optimistically, uh, to invest uh, uh. in buying some shares. If you could advise our audience here yeah, yeah. of a great listed company, where should they spend their £100, lock it up for five yeah. years, and then take it back, having made a great return? Now, what, I, what's your advice? I think we've got to be slightly careful here, because there's always a risk we'll be carted off to prison because of the regulatory rules. Strictly, yeah. Chatham, yeah. strictly Chatham House um, rule. You know, I think, again, if you... <laughs> maybe that's a good thing if we're carted off. <laughs> I, um, you know, the, what would say is, you know, again, if you... What always like in a company is a company that essentially sort of where the longer term prospect is good but, but is not been sort of appreciated mm -hmm. by, a, by the market. Yeah, you, know, you said before in terms of free so time. It was valuable but undervalued. Exactly. And, and, you sort and of just it, to push you on time, because we've got this flashing red light. <laughs> I think which... the free to air broadcasters sort of are, so are a very interesting space. So ITV. Yeah, I think well, that, that looks attractive. I, I would. I personally prefer the broadband story over the TV story. It's simpler. Um, there's still a lot more growth going in the US. Mm. And on that basis, we would buy Charter, which is the second biggest broadband provider in the US. 
lots of cost to come out of the business, lots of simplification after they integrate Time Warner Cable and broadband's easier to understand than TV.